You remember last last week we talked about Joseph's revelation brings reconciliation. When Joseph shows himself, the result is reconciliation with the family. And with that comes amazing grace and unfailing love. That is incredible. That is what's coming to the family. But the reconciliation isn't complete. It's not just that you say, hey, I'm sorry, you're sorry, I'm sorry, you're sorry. That's good, but it's not complete. The goal of reconciliation is to live together. That's the goal. So you could say this is bringing you into the goal of reconciliation, the result of reconciliation. This is a hard lesson that a lot of Christians don't understand. A lot of Christians do not understand how to live in a home. What does it mean to live in a home together with others? Can you live in a home? Can people even stand you in the home? Or do they say, get out of here, so-and-so, I can't stand you. What are we like? What are we really like? I'll tell you, brother and sister in Christ, there's two different things about you, okay? There's who you think you are and who you really are. Who you think you are is one thing, but who you really are is something else. Are you willing to see who you really are? You'll discover that in a home. So many Christians, they run from place to place. They run from coffee shop to coffee shop. They run from church to church. They run from friend to friend, and they don't want to be discovered. They want to hide their true self. They want to drift. They want to be a perpetual gypsy. And along the way, they probably offend people, bother people, but they keep moving. They do not get reconciliation. Do you know how to live with God's people? If you know how to live with them, then you'll know the fruit of reconciliation. Because that is what reconciliation is meant to bring to birth. Home life. Home life. Are you willing to be exposed for who you really are? Or is it all about, it's their fault. It's their fault. It's parents' fault. (laughs) Grandparents' fault. It's not my fault. Friends, I'm just trying to be practical to you. This is what happens when you know... Christians don't want to live in a home. I've seen it so many times over my decades of being a Christian. You bring something up to someone one day, and the next day they're gone. Someone comes out to a church, starts coming out, this and that happens. The flow of church life goes on, and someone says, you know, not immediately. Hey, this, this, and that. Have you noticed this about you? What? Me? Something wrong? And they're gone. Have you ever tried to counsel people with a tough issue in their life? And they throw it back in your face. Has that ever happened to you? It will if you faithfully serve Jesus. If you're involved in reconciliation, it will happen. It is so important to let reconciliation have its full work. Will you finally say to your brothers and sisters in the church, in your family, in relationships, I was wrong, forgive me. When you do that, you can come home. You can finally come home with God's people. This is so important. And so many churches suffer because the elders and the deacons don't hold God's people accountable for how they live. It doesn't mean you tell people how to live. It doesn't mean you nag and go around and, you know, you wag your finger. I don't mean that. But elders, deacons, well, elders especially, so you could use our pastors too, they're shepherds of God's people. And Ezekiel 34, you read about it, is a condemnation of the shepherds because the sheep in Israel had wandered and gone into the hills and were kind of like lost and no one went after them. And the Lord says, I will go after my sheep and bring them home. Let's not forget, why is there a new home for Jacob's family? Why can they have a new home? Because reconciliation finally happened. Someone was honest and said, I was wrong. And the other person said, I forgive you. And then it starts. Home life. This is awesome. And I encourage all of you in this room, be God's faithful servant. Don't settle for anything less but reconciliation. North and South Korea have a truce. And in the middle of the country, there's this demilitarized zone, a DMZ. And you'll see pictures where there's like soldiers on each side. 
And the North Koreans even shoot their own soldiers if they try and run the 20 or 30 yards or something to get to the south. It's a state of war, but they have a truce. Christians, never do that. Never be in the situation where with God's people you're in a state of war. No, no, reconciliation. It says, pursue peace with all men and the holiness without no man shall see the Lord. Now, some people may not want it. I'll tell you right now. Some people may not want it. But on your end, on your side, pursue reconciliation. Do all that you can to who you are to get it. Having said that, what is it that happens in Genesis 45 at the end? Remember, I called it responding with shock and faith. So when Jacob hears the news, he says, I can't believe it. But then he says, I believe it. What was it that convinces him to go? Genesis 45, verse 27. When they had told them all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Then Israel said, it is enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Verse 27. It's the words of Joseph, and it's the works of Joseph. His words and his works are what convince Jacob. And so it is the works of Jesus Christ, the words of Jesus Christ, and the works we bring to each other, you might say. We bring the word of reconciliation to each other, and we bring the works of reconciliation too. And those two things together bring hope to God's people. Jacob has hope. Yes, I will. Now look at the text. It says, verse 27, Jacob, verse 28, Israel. Because once Jacob chooses to go by faith, and to go on the pilgrim journey, he becomes a man again of dignity and purpose and power. He becomes the prince who wrestles with God and prevails. Jacob becomes Israel in that transaction of faith. When we live by unbelief, on a self-pity, or whatever else we're doing, we're just natural so-and-so. But once we choose to walk by faith, dignity in that moment dignity. A man named C.H. McIntosh said this, the name Jacob refers to the depth to which God descended to meet him. How far did God have to go to meet this man? That's Jacob. Jacob's the, the, the conniver, the crooked. God had to go way down to meet Jacob. The word Israel has to do with the height to which Jacob is raised by the Lord. When Jacob agrees with God's mercy and plan in the Messiah, he's raised. He becomes Israel. Any of you in the room, dignity is, is with you in Christ right now. Trust him. Trust his word. But especially trust his guidance for your life. That's risky, but it's the best when God is guiding you. So, let's go ahead and share some outlines. Faith becomes sight becomes action is blessed. And one to four is faith becomes sight, Jacob's vision. Five to seven. Sight put into action, Jacob on the road to Egypt. 8 to 26, all 66 children present and accounted for. 28 to 34, action is blessed, moving to Goshen. My title is One Big Happy Family. One of four is God spoke to Jacob and told him, Don't be afraid of Egypt. We'll make family into a great nation. 5 to 27, family road trip. 28 to 30, Joseph hugs Jacob and weeps. 31 to 34, um, family reunited. I call it a new home for Jacob's family because that's what's happening here. The, the whole family is coming into a home. They aren't just visiting somewhere. 1 through 7, God's perfect leading. In reaching that home, we need his perfect leading. We have to have it. We're not going to get there without his perfect leading. 8 through 27. Along the way, count the kids. I think it happened once that our family went bowling and one of our kids got left behind. <laughs> A very cute kid. And the kid was very sad. But then we, in moments, but in only moments, we recognized, we counted. Wait, I'm counting. There's one missing. Turn the car around. <laughs> and go back and we recovered that sheep so you got to count the whole family that's what god's doing he's counting the whole family 28 through 30 reunited with unspeakable joy it really is that 
and 31 to 34, guidance. More guidance to protect the family. Because the family needs guidance. It says he journeyed with all that he had. Was he thinking of it as a permanent move and not just going there to see Joseph and then coming back? Yes, uh, it is a permanent move. Yeah, uh, Jacob knew it was permanent, at least for the foreseeable future. Nothing was to be left behind. They all go together. So yeah, they uprooted and uh, left the land. A pretty spectacular th thing to do. 46 verse 1. So Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Jacob. So it's Israel traveling now. No longer crooked Jacob. Israel's traveling and came to Beersheba. So Beersheba is on the southern part of the land, like the very border almost of like Canaan, you might say the boundaries. So he has heard the testimony of his sons. He's believing it and he's moving. He's moving his household. By the way, there's a lot of people in this group. There's servants. There's other people too. This is a big group of people. And so I, I call this section God's perfect leading. Because to move to a new home, you need God's perfect leading. You don't risk it on a whim. You don't risk it on an impulse. You don't say, oh, I'm mad at you. I'm leaving and getting my own home in some impulse of rage. Some youth do that when they leave their parents' home. Out of impulsive rage, they leave their home. How sad that is for them to leave a parent's home unreconciled. But Jacob is moving as Israel in reconciliation. And so he has God's perfect leading. But you know what? Jacob does something. It says in verse 1, he offers sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. He's honoring his father, Isaac. How hard is it for people to honor their parents today? Very hard. Why is God's curse on so many young people? Because they, they dishonor their parents. I mean, I don't even mean Christian. I just mean the general. I mean the general world. I don't mean like some particular person. When you honor your father and mother, it will go well with you, and you should be blessed on the earth. Read about it in Galatians 6 and Exodus 20, I think. So he's moving in honor, but it says here that he offers sacrifices. And so as he knows God's perfect leading, you know what he does? He says, Lord, I need you. I'm afraid because I've never gone this way before. I've never gone to Egypt. I don't know what this means. I know they say Joseph's there, but I'm scared because he says, do not be afraid. And he's not going to say, do not be afraid for nothing. You know, not, the Lord's not just saying, do not be afraid because there's nothing to be afraid of. It is, it is a fearful thing. And so Psalm 25 who does God lead? Jacob's showing us the character, the type of man or woman God leads. Psalm 25, verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs Jacob's in the way. Oh, sinners. Jacob's in the way. He leads the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. He will lead and teach the humble. He will lead and teach the meek. It's because you're so arrogant and autonomous. You want to control your own life and you think you know better. I know better. I know better. No, God knows best. God will teach you his ways if you're teachable. So going to Genesis 46, Jacob is offering sacrifices at Beersheba. And God said to Israel in visions of the night, isn't this like Genesis 28? God appearing to Jacob at another crisis, going to Bethel, fleeing for his life from Esau on the run. The murderer is behind him. He better take off fast. He meets him in Bethel. God meets him again. He called him by name. Jacob says, here am I. I'm the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I'll make you a great nation there. I will go down with you. And I will also bring up again, and Joseph will close your eyes. What an incredible promise. It's sealed. The, the deal is sealed. So what are the three things that Jacob gets? Three peas in a pod. He gets God's promises, he gets God's proof, and he gets God's presence. And so uh, verse 5, he arises from Beersheba, and he says, fall in, let's go. And they're all going down. Everyone's going in. So let me stop and ask some questions. Question one, moving to a far distant land is life-changing. 
How will Israel's decision to go into Egypt change everything for his family? They're in a new culture. They're in a new culture. Okay. What else will change uh, as they're moving? Hopefully not their faith in God. Good. Not their faith in God. Look, he took the question and he did like a judo move. Good. Good. I like it. I like it. Not the faith. Yeah. Don't change your faith in God. What you work at ultimately did with them, they started, ended up just making bricks. You can have a change that happens with how you do your livelihood. Does it potentially lead the Hebrews into slavery? Yes. Now, why are they going into Egypt? In Genesis 15, it says in verse 13, And God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years, but I will judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. So yes, it'll change your comfort level. It'll absolutely change that. Because they're about to descend into suffering. Not day one, though. But the nation is moving. The small group that's the foundation of a nation is moving into a place that will eventually become a furnace for them. And a furnace purifies metal in like the first Peter 1, the trial of your faith, be more precious than gold that, that perishes, though tried by fire. So they're going to go in the furnace eventually, or the heat will be tur turned up on them by the e Egyptians. So there's a lot. But let, let me say this, how, because the question is how will it change? They will have new relationships, a new home, new occupation, and I would say an enlarged purpose. They will have a larger purpose. Not a different purpose, but larger. When God leads you to a new home, his purpose for you gets bigger. Things just got bigger. Big when it comes to God's work is good. Like, what is God doing? Now, why, why do Christians move? Why do some Christians zip here and zip there and say, well, I'm going to go here and I'm going to do this and that? James 4, verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we shall go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Why do some Christians move? They move to get money. They move to make a profit. Like it says there, let's have a business, let's make a profit natural, legitimate impulse. Those are often the most dangerous things. The greatest enemy to God's purpose in your life are the good things. It's the legitimate things. Not so much the evil things necessarily. So he says here, come now you who say today or tomorrow we shall go. But instead we should say, if the Lord wills. Jacob said, if the Lord wills. Israel prayed that. Lord, in Beersheba, is this your will? He's praying, Lord, Guide me. Let's say, if the Lord's will. When you say, if the Lord's will, verses 1 through 7, you'll have God's perfect leading. He will lead the person who asks, is this your will? I mean, honestly asks. Say it to them, hey, why don't you just pray and fast over that thing? Why don't you humble yourself? Turn off all the devices. Go with a couple friends and pray over this thing. How, mm -hmm. how healthy is that? It can't hurt. It certainly can't hurt. <laughs> you know what will happen? It's only something good that can come well, out of it. It'll hurt the waistline. That's what it'll hurt. <laughs> and we pray and we seek God with all of our heart. Then he'll answer us. But first within. And you know what? You'll come away with a changed attitude about the brothers and sisters in your churches, in your family, in your neighborhood. Mr. or Miss Critical will die on the altar of prayer. Wow. Simply because you prayed. That is a good death, by the way. That, yeah. that character is a really good death. Why does it die? Because how can you stand in the presence of an all-merciful, all-powerful God and be critical? You won't, if you're really in God's presence. In Luke 15, it says that a Pharisee came to the temple and said, God, I, I thank God I'm not like that tax gatherer. And he prayed to himself, it says in that chapter. It's not the type of prayer. So we're talking about movement, leading, a home, and God's perfect guidance and all that. Second Question, why is Jacob's family mentioned in t detail in this chapter, including the number of people who come to Egypt? Why is the family mentioned like name by name, right? We, we read all of those names. 
Well, names are recorded in, is it Malachi, where it says that the names of those who were a part of the elect yeah. were named or are written in God's book. But also, the Lord Jesus says that he knows us by name. He knows us by name. He calls his sheep by name, right? John chapter 10 and Malachi 3, verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. So the Lord writes a book of remembrance, and those who fear him talk to each other. That is, he knows who's talking, and he notes it, and he writes it. What we say in fearing the Lord will come into another age, and another realm somehow. When it's written, not being erased. It's written. We should talk a lot about the Lord Jesus, how good he is, how kind he is to us. We should talk a lot about with each other. Those words are worth remembering. So let me tell you about the names. Uh, look back in Genesis 46. There's something very subtle go going on here. It's subtle, it's deep, and it's hard to find. But this is what's happening. From 8 through 27, 70, it says, came in. How is God counting? Counting the entire family, I called it. God's counting in a really unusual way. What he's doing is he's counting everybody who's going to play a part one way or another in the foundation of the nation. That is, th th like if you had pillars of a house, this is the base of the, the, base of the pillars. Because uh, in uh, Numbers 26, again, these 12 tribes will be enumerated. Look in Deuteronomy 10 verse 20. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and cling to him, you shall swear by his name. He is your praise and he is your God who has done these great and awesome things for you which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons in all. And now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. This is incredible. 450 years later, maybe, from when um, Jacob crosses the border to when they go out. I'm just giving a, a, a rough number because it says they're in 400 years. So Deuteronomy 10 has been 40 years, right? They've been 40 years wandering in uh, the wilderness at, at the end of it. So maybe 450 years later, they're, they're numerous. They have multiplied incredibly from 70 to hundreds of thousands. Incredible multiplication. And this is the fulfillment of promises to Abraham. I'll make your uh, seed as a sand on the seashore. It's happening. The promises are, are being kept. But Genesis is taking the time to show us how did it start? How did you get to a big nation? Well, let's go to the 70. What is it about the 70? Some of them are born in Egypt, like Judah's son. Judah has a son there, right? Sons of Judah. He has three sons. Two of them die, we know. And then there's Perez and Zerah, who are the sons of Shelah. And then the sons of Perez are Hezron and Hamel. So that's grandsons. So there's three generations there in Judah, father, son, and grandson in verse 12. But they're all counted together. It doesn't mean they're all out of the womb. Just the fact that in the man is the potential of that child, the child is there. That's how it's counted. So the seeds in the man. So the, the man is there, so his line is there. That's what it's saying. It's pretty awesome, the way God counts. It's not the way we would count. Say you got a church, right? Okay, well, let me count the rich church members. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, they all have a half million dollars in assets. Let me count the pretty. One, two, three, okay, only two. <laughs> and let me count the strong, and let me count the this, and let me count. We count in all the wrong way. We count the natural. God counts those who are the pillar of his church. That's how he counts. He counts differently. It's amazing stuff, how God counts. You know, in 2 Timothy 2, in verse 19, just to get the idea of this counting, it says here, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands firm, having the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. He counts. He knows. One by one, those who are his. It's when God counts us, that's what counts. Now, he's counting the entire family because the entire family is going to this new home. Third question, why should we know the names of everyone in our church who is heading in the same direction towards the heavenly Goshen? Because we don't want to neglect anyone. Like, 
um, we could like oversee someone. It's good to like be sure to talk to everyone. Don't neglect anyone. Talk to everyone. Get to know everyone. Get the dynamite at the base of the snobbish click circle and blow it up. Know everyone's name. Care about everyone. Going in that direction. Why should we know everyone's name? We know who our fellow workers are in Christ and we can labor with them. Yes, because we're here to do a work. We're not here to goof off and eat bonbons. <laughs> we're here to do a work. It's called the work of the Lord, not the vacation of the Lord. It's the work of the Lord. Anyone else about names? So I can pray for them? Amen. Excellent. I hope you know my name by now, right? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Thought you did. But um, anything else about names? More so in that time, names had real meaning and they would reflect even what a person's disposition was, what their calling was. It could represent yeah. a lot of things about them. So I think knowing people's names here to me would mean to really know people and know what they're about, to have a, a relationship with them. I think it means more to just be able to pass them in the aisle and say, hi, John, know these people. Yes. yes. Now look at the chapter. I'm going to bring it right back to the chapter. The names are divided, divided into four groups. There are the, it says here, there are the children from Leah. And uh, that's going to, remember, uh, that's going to be from verse 8, Reuben, to verse 15. That's Leah's kids, including Dinah. Jacob and Leah's union, these, these other people come. So at verse 16, it's going to be Jacob and Zilpah, verse 16 to 18. That's another group of people, different people, different group, less people. The third, look at verse 19, the sons of Jacob's wife, Rachel. Can we call Rachel Jacob's wife? Because in Genesis 48, the, the text says Rachel is Jacob's wife again twice. And so at least from Jacob's heart, remember, Rachel is the wife of Jacob's double service. He had to serve 14 years. Mm -hmm. The wife he really labored for. And that was the one he won in the first place. And Joseph and Benjamin tend to have a, a real concentration of blessing and God's focus on them. And then the last group has to do with Bilhah. Verse 25. So that would be 23, 24, and 25. Dan only has one son, by the way. Not very fruitful. Naphtali has some more. Bill has children. So Dan has one kid. Benjamin has a bunch of kids. In a Benjamin's line, it's a grandson's too. And in the Hebrew, grandsons are sometimes considered sons, just in the language of the situation. So here's the thing about knowing God's people. Some Christians are more fruitful. Some Christians are less fruitful. Some Christians are more natural. Some Christians are more spiritual. Some Christians are more active. Some are more passive. There's differences in the family of God. As you pray for people and help them to become more like Christ, understand the differences. That's why you know the names, because others said you know the person. You really know who the person is. These names do represent different characteristics of God's people. Not everyone's equal. Not everyone's at the same place with Christ. There is coming a day where we can all come to the fullness of maturity. But at this point, we're all different places in other race, you could say. But we're in the same, same race. So 20 through 30, reunited with unspeakable joy. Third question, why does Israel want to die once he has seen Joseph? They get reunited in verse in chapter 46. And so what happens there? And Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father, Israel, verse 29. And so Joseph comes in all of his royal dignity. He's coming in the splendor of his Egyptian position, and he meets Jacob. And then it says, as soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a long time. As soon as he appeared, the moment he gets off the chariot, Jacob gets out of the wagon, and they embrace and they stand for a long time weeping. Friends, you gotta pause. You just gotta pause and ponder, where is my heart? Like us, right? I mean, me. How much do we love God's people? How much do we not love them? Why are they weeping so much? 
sometimes when Christians get together, it's very shallow and very superficial. But what had happened to Joseph? He had suffered in prison and pain with chains on his ankles, chains around his neck, weeping in a hole in a prison. And he's probably weeping for his father who thinks he's dead. Yeah. Jacob's weeping because my son's dead. And for 20 plus years, he's weeping, he's weeping, he's weeping in his soul. So there's suffering, but there's also hope. Jacob thought, well, I'll see him in the resurrection. No, you'll see him sooner than that. There's separation. It's the pain of separation. And then there's the true love. All of these combine in the perfect storm of tears. It is perfect. It is not fake. It is not Hollywood. This is real. And so I call it unspeakable joy because they're not saying a thing to each other. They're just weeping. May God bring us to the place where there's such a depth of love in us for God's people. You know, we meet them. Something moves in us deeper than a shallowness. And you know what gets it is a suffering. 1 Peter 1, verse 7. That the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So even now, we can have joy inexpressible. You can't say it, but you have it. And to have it, you got to make room for it. So let God's giant excavator dig out all the selfishness out of your heart. And let there be room for love in your heart. Joy inexpressible and full of glory. You know why some people have joy? Got money. Got my tasty sugar bomb. Got my fan club to flatter me again. So that's why people have joy, as shallow as that is. That's, that's, that's a shallow joy. Very, very shallow. It's joy inexpressible. Because they thought they were dead. Where else is this in uh, the New Testament? Luke 15, verse 20. My son was dead. I thought he was dead, but now he's alive. And the father runs to the prodigal son. When he sees him afar off, he runs and he weeps on his shoulder. There's reasons to weep as a Christian. Not your self-pity. Not I couldn't get my way. But so deep in your heart is, is the love of God for God's people and, and for the Lord Jesus. And it's going to work over years and decades. So, having said that, why does Israel want to die once he has seen Joseph? Die at a high point. Die at a high point, right? Go out on a high point. Joseph's here. Lord, elevator, top floor. Let's go. <laughs> top floor <laughs> elevator. <laughs> Bring me up. Any other thing in the room? Well, Why? You know, there's a puzzle piece missing for 20 years. He might feel complete. We have to know that God does have a day of death appointed for us. But it's not what we think, necessarily. Our days are numbered, Psalm 90 says. God has an exit time for us. He really, really does. So with Jacob, he is 130 years when he meets Pharaoh. He's going to live 17 more years. Though he's ready to die when he meets Joseph... There's 17 more years of labor he needs to do with his family. He's teaching his grandsons. He's teaching his granddaughters, great-granddaughters about the gospel, about Abraham's promises. He's teaching them, right? He's moving about. He's sharing the word of God with them. He's older, but they're coming to him out of respect and honor. And he's talking about things about them. He's handing the truth to the next generation. That's why we have to stick around. To hand the truth... So until the day the Lord takes us away, may we have the opportunity, by His grace, to keep speaking the truth and love to God's people Amen. until that day comes. So here's the last part. Guidance for family protection. Genesis 46. Shepherds are an abomination to Egyptians. Why did the Egyptians hate shepherds? Did someone have an idea about that? Because they love God. They loved their gods, so maybe a, like a way to say that. Thanks for saying that. The Egyptians loved their gods, and their gods were crocodiles and cats, because cats were worshipped, uh, birds. I don't think they had sheep in their pantheon. So good point. Yeah, they loved the wrong things. Here's what I wanted to say and kind of wrap this thing up. They've come to a new home, and he says, you know what? I got to tell you something. 
He's going to say, you need to position yourself a certain way because you're going to be in Goshen, the best of the land. Don't give off this identity. Give off this identity instead. Mm -hmm. Now, don't say this, but say that. He's coaching them. Why did the Egyptians despise a shepherd? Because different reasons I'll give to you. Egypt had been controlled in the past by outsiders called shepherd kings. And so there had been a ruling class in Egypt that had, you might say, oppressed Egypt. They were from the outside. Also in Egyptian's history, there had been peoples coming down from Canaan and like raiding them and attacking them and harassing them. So they thought, you know, shepherds aren't really good people. But whatever the reason is, do you know how to behave in the culture in just the right way? Do you know how to behave in American culture? What's the tact you take as Christians in America today? Heavenly Goshen. Goshen, in a certain way, speaks in different ways. But in one way, it speaks of the church. The church is called the gate of heaven. And so, though we're on the earth, we have a heavenly identity and a heavenly enjoyment. So, that's, that's what the church is supposed to be. But also, there's a coming age where God's people will be in a literal land in an age to come. Also, there was light in Goshen where it was dark everywhere else. Yes, thank you. So there's five things. In Joseph's advice, he has a five-fold strategy. His first thing is separation. He's going to put them in Goshen so they're not defiled by mixing with other Egyptians. He has to separate them from the rest of the nation. So you're going to have a certain land. That's your land, not somewhere else. Separation. The second thing of his strategy is congregation. He's going to keep them together. In staying together, they'll have the mutual strength of their companionship. So one land, one place. He's not going to scatter them to do a hundred jobs throughout the Egyptian empire. He could have appointed them to that. The third thing is occupation. He's going to recommend them to Pharaoh's herds and stuff like that. He's going to give them a good occupation, something that frees them up for the service of Jehovah. There's many jobs at the Egyptian empire. Give them that job. Because that occupation will make them available for what God is doing. They need to be available to serve the Lord. So what's your occupation? Fourth thing, consecration. It's the best of the land. That's Goshen. They're going to go from 70 to like hundreds of thousands of people. This is a big land. This is really rich. It's called the best of the land where you could grow lots of crops there, have lots of livestock. And enjoying the best of the land, they will be equipped for special service. And by the way, Christian, in Christ, we have the best provision Amen. of wisdom, of insight, of purity, of knowledge, of power. And the last is there's going to be preparation because Goshen is positioned on the edge of the empire. And so he's getting his family in position to get out of there. They're going to go. They're coming to go. They got a new home, but it's not permanent. It's for a while. They're preparing to launch again because being on the edge of the empire is the easiest way to leave. You can't put them like next to Ethiopia. Then they got to march through all these cities, you know, for like a month before they could leave Egypt. You're going to put them on the edge. So they hit the Red Sea and they take off. So think of this, dear Christian. Don't be afraid for God to bring you to new places. Don't cling like an idol to God's past blessings. Yeah, God's blessed you. And I'm not saying you have to move, okay? I'm just saying God wants to move you, whether geographically or in relationships. I mean, knowing more of God's people. He definitely wants to move you in a sense of in the friendships, deeper friendships, different friendships with God's people. He wants you to get to know all 70 of the group. You're one, there's 69 more. So I got to know the other 69. So move around and get to know them. Also know this, the Spirit of God is moving in our day. The Spirit of God wants to lead His people. He wants to guide His people. Are we willing to let the Spirit of God have sovereignty in our family, in our home, in our relationships? Will the Spirit of God really be sovereign, or will it be my wisdom and the works of my flesh? Will you finally give up control? You don't have to wait till you're 130, by the way, to give up control. Just, as Jacob. Just give up control right now, and the Lord will guide you into that new home. The Holy Spirit's moving in a great way today. He's going to leave us behind. If we want to stay in the famine-parched land, he's going to leave us behind. If we want to go to Goshen, we can go with him. Know where the Spirit's going and go with him there. God bless you, friends.